Hello, everybody. Welcome to our stream today. I'm so excited to talk with two of my friends and YouTube channel strategists. So I'm going to bring them on one at a time so they get their flowers here for their intros. The first one, we are going to be talking and bringing on Gwen Miller. Now, Gwen Miller is the senior director and YouTube strategist over at <coughs> Hearst, and she specializes in working with creatives to use data-driven insights to create high-quality digital programming crafted to super serve each channel's unique one-of-a-kind audience. Previously, Gwen was the VP of content at Kin, a digital women's lifestyle company that brought recognizable talent such as Tia Maori, Adrian Houghton, Houghton, and Tori Spelling to the digital screen. Other past roles include Endemol Shine and Discovery Networks, among a variety of other entertainment companies. And in her free time, Gwen attempts to find out how many books it is feasible to read in a year. Last count was around 240. And she plays D&D. &D. So everybody, please welcome Gwen to the stream. Hello, hello, hello. hello. <laughs> Awesome. I'm so glad that you're here to join. And then next, we're going to bring on Michael Loomis. Now, Michael Loomis is the channel director over at the Arena Group, where he oversees the YouTube strategy and operations of multiple channels, such as Sports Illustrated and Sports Illustrated Swimsuit. Previously, Mike was senior manager at the tech behemoth of Oracle and most notably the sports entertainment giant WWE. And he helped grow their YouTube presence from 4 million subs to 75 million subs. Now, other past roles include production coordinator for the CBS hit show Entertainment Tonight. And he was the manager of digital content at the arts cable network Ovation TV. When he isn't YouTubing, Mike is bowing down to his wife, as you should, and wrangling his two-year-old son, six-year-old daughter, and eight-year-old golden retriever named Larry David. <laughs> now, he enjoys hiking, biking, swimming, taking Larry on adventures, and checking out his favorite jam band concerts. Everybody, please welcome Michael Loomis to the show. Woo! Welcome, welcome, Thanks welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs> This is so exciting. I'm so excited that you guys are here today. Now, first things first, we always do open up the show with maybe a silly question, but it's a question nonetheless that is, it's just tradition. So we're going to go with it. That question today is what's in your cup? Today I'm drinking Starbucks and um, I'm lying. It's a Starbucks cup and really inside it's Amazon Fresh Bakes Basics uh, coffee with the premier protein chocolate shake. So that's me in a nutshell. How about Michael? What do you got? I have a good old H2O quite this solo cup it's just water i promise mm -hmm. yeah or adult water fizzy water oh speaking of fizzy water how about gwen what's in your cup this morning high class sparkling water from kroger which i dropped on the ground so it's uh very bent up <laughs> oh there you, shape. Go. you know what I, I i was saying before like it's consistency i've had you on my show before it was the same water so, you know, you like what you like. So I, I literally, if you could see, if I turn my camera to my hallway against the wall, I have just packs and packs of Kroger seltzer water just stacked. <laughs> okay. So, you know, when the apocalypse comes also who to come to. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like it might I am be flat it. by the time we get through all of it, but it'll be here. It'll be here. Okay, perfect. So one of the things that we're going to have to get to know each other a little bit, by the way, I'm your host, Shelly Saves the Day, former senior video manager and product expert over at TubeBuddy, now freelance channel manager slash up gun for hire. Um, so if you are not talking about YouTube in your day job, and you're now then relaxing, and it's now not just for research, and it's for fun, I'm going to give you a little pop quiz here. So give me maybe one or two channels that you watch in your free time to relax when you're ready to unwind from your day job. How about Gwen? Okay, so I'm actually going to throw out a couple that are kind of more shorts focused because uh, I think uh, I, I think Michael, like I, we're probably like uh, likewise obsessed with this new space on uh, YouTube and what are they yes. going to do with it? And there's been a couple that I just like cannot get enough of. One of them is a guy named B. Dylan Hollis. And if you go to his actual like channel, there's actually maybe th I think three or four long form videos from like a year ago, but he has just gone all in into shorts. 
And he's doing actually a concept that I wanted to do for years at a major company, but I'd never be able to do at a major company because it wouldn't come out as interesting as he, he has it come out, which is take old weird recipes. So like something from like the 19th century or something from the Great Depression, which sounds it, like it should be disgusting. And then in the short, he makes it. And then I would say 75% of the time, it actually turns out to be amazing and then 25 percent of the time it's it's as bad as it looks but his personality is just pristine uh and oh yeah you found him yeah uh and I I, he's out. just like, like don't you threaten perfect. me going with a good time and baking i'm gonna find it oh <laughs> yeah you're gonna, you're gonna pull oh, out at the at, at christmas shelly's gonna pull out some obscure recipe turkish delight from like <laughs> the 20. just watch the turducken's coming out of the oven man <laughs> Um, should we trade off or should I finish my top three? Go ahead. You finish. Yeah. Okay. The next one is called Cooking with Lynn. Uh, and this is another kind of, uh, I've at least only mostly seen her with, uh, yeah, L-Y-N-N, -N, uh, doing shorts. And she is like this little grandma who has the biggest personality and does a lot of, you know, how it's really a lot of these shorts when it comes to food now are very ASMR driven, but she does that and still manages to have like a high, like she was at the top. Cooking Is this Lynn. one? Okay. I was like, yes. mm. okay. grandma. Yeah. Aww. Okay. Lin Linja. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and she just has this really like, it is just like the zaniest over the top personality. You could not make someone in a laboratory that's more perfect for YouTube. Uh, and those are the things that is so hard to find. And when they bubble up from the cauldron that is YouTube, I, I just, I can't get enough of it. And then the, my third one might be cheating because you could argue that this is kind of in like industry focused, but I would argue it's not specific to Michael and my state job because we do co the corporate level of this. But it <laughs> you don't does, have to justify. It's okay. You just tell us. It you does just give us a, a, a kind of a window into, say, the creator level. So this would be Colin and Samir. Oh, yeah. Um, I think they're just killing yep. it in this space in terms of doing more long form, thoughtful type of analysis of this stuff, which I think is very necessary within this space right now. So I think they're doing the Lord's work and um, I do actually do watch them on my off time. One of the greatest things, their video where they talked about hitting 1 million subscribers, I am actually in that video just for a brief second because they hit it while on stage talking at Vid Summit. Oh, and they yeah! turn and pan into the crowd and I'm there in the front row being like, oh my gosh, going crazy. <laughs> like, and I put it as a short on my channel too because it was a very special moment. There was an actual mic drop that happened because he was just so emotional. So it's a great video. And uh. my fangirl of the moment, I clipped a YouTube short back when it was only allowed to be five seconds. And I, from that video, and they commented on it. And I was like, yes. Aw. Yes. Right? Exactly that, aw. That's really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Gwen. How about Michael? You want to share with us? Thanks, Gwen. Yeah, that's awesome. I will watch all those channels now. Um, so I watch a lot of kids' content because I have children. Um, so I'm going to just name one because I think she does a great job with her content and channel management and everything. And she just hooks your toddler right away. And her name is Miss Rachel. Now her voice is debatable if it's annoying or not annoying, but my kid loves her. So check her out, Miss Rachel. She is a, a, an ex-Broadway singer and so is her husband. And they just created this like little, uh, you know, children's YouTube channel that's now grown and they have millions of millions of views and subscribers and, and it's funny and it's quirky and it's Sesame Street and it's everything combined with kids' content. So is it the songs for little? Yes, yes, I've heard it for like I would say over like the shorts TikTok space, like the amount of parents who are obsessed with her and would like go to war for Miss Rachel. Like I'm like, who is this lady? Like she I think the parents are more into her than kids. <laughs> my I, my my son is counting to twenty, and he's like six months ahead of when he should be counting to twenty. So. Thank you, Miss Rachel. Does, like, she does like baby sign language too. She does like a lot that. of that. They do a lot of close ups um, of her mouth, and she does like uh, it's not, it's not phonetics, but she shows how to speak and how to move your tongue and your mouth. And it's really cool. 
Now, I think one thing that's interesting on here, they are obviously, I don't know if you guys can see this, but the Miss Rachel as the handle. We're going to be talking more about handles a little bit later yeah. on, but just wanted to show that the handle can be different than the channel name, and some people haven't quite figured that out. But, Michael, hit us with your next one. All right, my next one is That Was Epic. Do you guys know That Was Epic? Juan. Oh, this is, I mean, he he's just, I love all these prank channels. Prank Ed Bassmaster, all the, you know, fart, jokey, make me laugh. That's my go-to, but that was epic. This guy, he's just, he does like good pranks, right? Like he'll like do a prank, but then give the person money, which is like a huge trend right now, all over TikTok and YouTube and IG, whatever. But his videos are just spectacular. He, he just interacts with the public and does funny videos, like kind of like Big Dolls. You know who Big Dolls is? The same kind of content. And he is just like the most likable guy. He puts out content that everybody wants to watch. Um, so I really uh, highly suggest checking out his channel. Love that. All right. You got one more to hit right. us with? I got one more. And I could say Mr. Beast, but that's so cliche. It's so cliche. It be cliche because... Um, but I will say Mark <laughs> Rober, who's also cliche. Mark Rober is amazing. He's the so ex NASA uh, scientist yeah. dude that makes, you know, turns science into fun stuff. Like he catches the phone scammers, or he catches the um, the the people who steal packages. The glitter off bomb your, one was the epic. glitter bomb is the shiz. The yeah. the squirrels and the like, and the racing thing in like the backyard. I Amazing. mean, his thumbnails, his thumbnails, his click-through rate must be so high. They're just so simple and beautiful, and I just want to click on each one. Now, here's one thing that's right? interesting about Mark Rober is because, well, he was also involved, um, speaking of Mr. Beast, in that Team C's project that was out there as a fundraiser to help clean up the oceans and waterways, yes. which was amazing. But he typically only puts out one video a month which is very unlike a lot of other YouTube channels. And so I think that's fascinating. And and not only Mark Rober is an entire channel focused on one man, as was the Miss Rachel, as was the cooking with Linja. And you both work on properties that have multiple. It's like when you're on WWE, you can't just focus on, you know, the divas or Nikki or Brie Bella or, or whatever. Or They're not Kia divas Mallory. anymore. They're not divas. Yes, don't that's say true. Divas, but, um, yeah. Now you have to focus on a property that has lots of different entities. And that's completely different yeah. than trying to grow something on a single branded channel. So we're going to talk about that as well because I think that's fascinating. Okay, so quickly, because I know people really, we want to get to the meat of this show, which is branding yeah. for YouTube and all that. So I'm going to say for one, um, mine is going to be, I like watching Philip Franco, so I can feel like I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about the world. And <laughs> I definitely enjoy Mark Rober as well, just because he, you know, he's like, if there's someone who's going to over engineer this, um, you know, glitter bomb package, it's going to be me and it's going to take six months, but you're going to like love it. And it's fantastic. Right. And we all enjoyed it. I mean, it's so good. It's so good. And um, I'm going to have to agree, Colin and Smear. Um, but if I'm going to throw in one extra, I love watching the editing breakdown with um, Hayden Hillier-Smith because yeah. one thing I'm not fantastic at is storytelling with editing. And he's mm. so good at it. And so he was also the, um, the and best. still is part-time maybe, an editor for Logan Paul. But now he also has an editing oh. podcast and he has an editing breakdown channel that he does. And it's fantastic because sometimes he even brings in the people and makes fun of their editing being like, this is another way to do it or this is how I would look at it. So I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So he's great. That's a good one. He's a great one. All right. So we're going to come over here. We're going to ask an opening question. And if you're out there please make sure to ask a question too because we were batting around the idea y'all have to let us know of maybe doing this maybe every few months so maybe if there's extra questions we might have to bring them in so one thing that is um, new and outgoing right now is this huge emphasis on shorts and the shorts bonus creator fund is going to be going away at the end of this calendar year and the new YouTube Shorts monetization program, a second way to enter into the YPP, is going to be out there for 10 million views within the last 90 days. Now, with the new focus on Shorts, what role, if any, do you think YouTube Shorts plays on a like a big corporate property such as yourself? Do so you guys use them? Do you not use them? Do you hate them? Let's spill. Let's start with Gwen. I will say this is something that we're starting to experiment with. You know, uh, I saw someone on Twitter have a sentiment that I do 100% agree with, which is I don't actually think that large, large corporations need to be the first on any new tool or or or, or uh, 
platform. Like this is kind right. of a mythos from the early days, but there's very little proof that the people, who, the companies who did come in first are any more successful than the ones who kind of take a cautious approach, wait and see and figure out the best practices as they go in. Whereas I have seen a lot of havoc that get caused within our industry when corporations are like, we're all in on this new thing. We don't know how it's going to make us money or if there's any way to pay my staff salary, but I'm going to put so much of our bandwidth into this new tool that if something slightly goes wrong with this tool, then I have to fire half my company. Cough, cough, Facebook and the pivot to video, right? When we were all doing like daily yeah. live watching, like having watermelons blow up and stuff like that. Like, so I do <laughs> take a very cautious approach of saying we are going to test, but I'm not going to get us so far over our skis that we could potentially have a business risk before we really see. Cause like, we don't know how well shorts is going to monetize. Like it's obviously going to monetize at slightly lower rates than VOD, but we can also get some pretty good views on it. So it might, it might be a viable source. So we will, we start to experiment. So now we're starting to experiment with like, you know, we do a lot of our content is celebrity driven content. So there's a lot of great stuff we can just clip from our long form, which is, you know, a really solid standalone piece of content. And we're going out with that type of thing. We're already very active on TikTok. So it's an easy port over. I always say, use all the parts of the cow, use the content in, in as many ways yes. possible. This is yes. an extra way to do that. That doesn't get us so far, far over our skis that we might run into problems in the future. Yeah, all, all great points. And, and as a brand, you have to be so cautious with all these to new tools because they come out every week. Every week there's a new yeah. adjustment to something or the algorithm or a new tool. It's like, don't jump into it too fast. So I've been so cautious and kind of nervous about it. I'm like, but they just put out stories. Like I'm still like, we're still crushing it in stories. Our second best subscriber gainer on the, on the channel. All right, fine. So giving in recently and we've been doing a full out blitz on shorts and now our strategy is just shifting. We're leaning into shorts so much on, on specifically our SI channel and SI swimsuit. Yeah. Um, we're just publishing way more out there. And um, this is basically like full length video cut down. So cut down is just turned, uh, turned into vertical form under 60 seconds. We put it on shorts right. and we see a lot of success on the long form success. So we see what's doing well over there and then we cut it down and put it on verticals. Also like teasers and promos and, um, you know, uh, repurpose. That really isn't a differentiator anymore. And plus, you know, I think a lot of the times, you know, there's still this thing that, you know, digital should be cheap, right? <laughs> so I think it can also get tough with this argument of like, hey, if you're going to keep up with these with people, like we have to be keeping up with the formats they're doing. And that may not be the same formats that we all could get away with in, say, 2016. Like the platform is evolving and changing and we need to evolve and change with it. And I think at, at a certain point, like, look, YouTube just in a lot of ways follows the eyeballs. Yeah. Do they, you know, prioritize some of their new products? I, I, I couldn't see how they could not. But at the end of the day, I also witnessed such a malaise on the platform coming out of the pandemic. I think especially from us in the kind of the more professional tier of the space, like we didn't really always iterate on our content during that time period. We were just kind of getting through. And so everyone was watching a lot of the same content over and over again during the pandemic and they were stuck inside and they had to watch it. And now I think they're just over it and they're tired and they're waiting for us to really say innovate in the space. In the meantime, shorts come along and this short form is something new for them that they can kind of sink their teeth into. So yeah, I, I think part I think part of it is just the eyeballs are going to shorts. And you can't always always say that the audience doesn't owe us their eyeballs if that's what they want to watch. Like, I would hope that YouTube will bring uh, the monetization to the level where we can make that transition as industry to make that an integral part of our strategies and still be able to support a team off of it. Yeah, and I, I think that the, the new audience, this new generation, they're like, they're over brands. They're over brands kind of telling them what to watch. Like, they want to see the Joe Schmo tell, like, making fun videos because it connects with them on a, a, a personal level. You know, so I, that's, and the funny thing about shorts is I see so much more potential for new 
creators on shorts than regular videos. The regular 16 by nine videos on YouTube is dominated by the monopoly of these juggernauts, like the Logan Pauls and, you know, Mr. Nice. Beast and like all this traffic. I mean, it's kind of wonky. Like I feel like it gets too much, they get too much traffic. They get too many views, but shorts does otherwise. You could be a nobody with two subscribers and your right. awesome short can go so far. Um, so it's different. They're so different right now. It's well, the shorts kind of mean, unbelievable. Is that so interesting because it does get shown to people who aren't subscribed to you. So the chances to no be seen to in play. variety, right? So that Wait. is one of those amazing discovery efforts that we can't even get YouTube to notify all of your subscribers of videos coming out. And yep. here they are finally showing it to people who aren't subscribed to you, who just in the player, like that's unheard of. Like I can just use a personal example for myself to to kind of illustrate how hard I think that YouTube has had to work in the past to get people to click on things that they have no kind of like intimate knowledge of, right? Like, you know, like I, and then we start complaining that, hey, YouTube shows us the same things over and over again as thumbnails. It's like, cause that's all we click on. Like, for example, like, and I know Shelly, I probably used this before, but like, there's a ton of stuff that I watch on TikTok on now in shorts that I, you would never catch me dead a year ago clicking on right. in a thumbnail. Right. Like, so like Irish sheep herders, I'm not clicking on a video that's <laughs> like, you know, Irish sheep dog techniques. But you better believe if that thing comes across my shorts feed, I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. I didn't know that. Ooh. So it removes that self filter that we all have that tells ourselves we're not going to be interested in this. And then lets us actually decide if we're interested in by actually showing us the content. And that to me is the brilliant thing about discovery with a, a, a non click to play product like this. And you can yeah. scroll. It's just yeah. easy. You, you just scroll keep yes. by. Bye-bye. No you don't have to like reload a page, reload the right? watch page. No. It's just and that's easy the breezy. thing is you don't you also don't get any information when it comes to click through because you don't get served any kind of thumbnail inside of the shorts feed. So I know a lot of people haven't quite also then figured out what's the deal with click-through rate and where do you actually see it and when does it actually matter? And so we could definitely chat about that. Also, I know I have seen it. It's in beta where there is going to be a thumbnail selector where you can go through the timeline similar to TikTok. It will be rolled out yeah. in an experimental phase starting with Android, but you'll be able to scrub through because sometimes, you know, the three options they give you aren't the best, aren't the best. So now one thing options. with... <laughs> now, one thing that does happen a lot with shorts is also you're able to capitalize on trends really, really quickly because those videos are really quick to produce and get out. But when it comes to trends in your long form VODs, how do you kind of incorporate that? Because a lot of the time you have a schedule that is months or quarters in advance. Mm -hmm. You're trying to balance mm -hmm. a schedule and all kinds of budgets. Can you participate in trends when you're a corporate brand or is that just kind of a no? Let's start with Michael. Um, I, I think it depends on the corporation and the brand. But like, so for example, at WWE, you know, if there was a, a trend, uh, a short term trend, you know, some funny dance, or you remember the blue green dress thing, the mm -hmm. debate, like, stuff like that, we could just send a crew out because they're already going to be out on the road shooting our main product uh, at WWE. So we can get them to ask questions to the wrestlers about whatever kind of trending topic there might be. So for that example, I mean, we could just do whatever we want and send people out and film it and it's over. And we had the leniency to do that. But then there's a lot of other corporations that can't, they don't have the luxury of that. And they do have to plan way ahead of time. So right. I think it just depends on the production, you know, of your company, like how many people you have out there filming and editing and whatnot. How about Gwen? I mean, look, you know, we're less of a, you know, I, the, the way that we might participate in, say, platform trends is more on the format level, which tends to change less quickly. Like, if we don't have a couple weeks with that. We might have a, a year to be able to do a certain type of fun format. I do truly believe in participating in kind of the YouTube formats uh, mm -hmm. for a, 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 a very simple reason. Like, you, again, 
it's that decision. How many decisions do people need to make before they click on your thumbnail? And you know, you're giving them, okay, do I know who this person is? Do I like this person? Do I like what this topic is? And then do I know what this format is? And if I like, I like it or not. And it's great to have the custom formats. The custom formats are bread and butter at making people realize we have a, a brand identity and that this is what they stay for. But oftentimes to get them in, it's useful to remove out the factor of whether they're going to like the format or not. Not So they know fridge tours, for example. They've seen a ton of fridge tours. They may, they may not even know who the talent is. They just like to be nosy about people's fridges. It's an easy <laughs> step in for new viewers to encounter the, uh, the content. And then maybe from there, there they go in and they click on more of our videos because they know that oh i like what women's health does or something like that so i'm going to give a try some of these other formats and then maybe they f fall in love with the custom formats but it is one of those things that i tell people that if all you're doing is these really boutique custom formats and you're seeing that you're not getting a lot of new viewers in it can be useful to do something that shows you that that you're part of the platform community and is an easy introduction to you and your your, your talents personalities to bring people in and then you get them to stay with that really fun custom no one else has this type of stuff love that yeah and i think i think as a brand it's hard to convince sometimes the higher ups into experimenting too like that's a difficulty that we have with all these stakeholders is like convincing them like no this is cool like we need to go this way instead they're kind of like stuck in the dark ages and they won't try new things so well, it's hard without the is. data sometimes to be like, yeah. that you can't get the yeah. data until you try it. So you I mean, try like, it. Just, we have to That's experiment. We have to say. try it. But speaking of data, and I know, Gwen, you are a data goddess here. But how do we like look at a channel and performance? Are we talking about categories, buckets, um, hosts? Like how, what kind of metrics or KPIs would you be looking for to even be able to quantify on a corporate channel, like what's successful, what isn't working, how do we know what to do more of? Like, how do you break that down right. when you're looking at it? Yeah, I think that is always whenever I come into a new corporate setting, one of my biggest goals for that initial year that I'm on board is to kind of uh, get people to understand the holistic view of data, that we need to have performance on multiple facets like it can be very easy for especially executives you know to get very distracted by the overall shiny level views right Ooh, but we got a ton of views they like to be able to go quota and be like you know we have a billion views across our network they just want the big shiny number uh but when you're actually saying we want to actually make this into a long-term viable money maker or business like we all want to be like have a salary in three years type of thing like you can't just rely on that overall shiny number because those of us who've worked in this space for a while understand there's a variety of ways you make money in the space and there's a variety mm -hmm. of like values assigned to what's the cpm you know how much can you make off a certain audience so if you're just going off overall views you can actually so i've seen channels in the same network that get a fifth of the, fifth of the views as like the top performing network uh, like channel in the network and they make double the money and that's the thing yeah. I have to make clear. And that's the way I usually start the argument because that's something that executives understand is cold hard cash. So if you're like, hey, like, and then you can start to get into like the things that make that a, 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 a true thing, which is things like having a strong core audience that comes back, like having ephemeral views that come in yeah. and then watch a video, one video and leave never again. Like that's not very valuable. You now you've made a fraction of a cent. Congratulations! But if yeah. you bring, if you <laughs> build a strong core audience, now that person is worth so much more because they're coming back, they're watching more content, you're getting more AdSense off that. But they're also an audience you could potentially convert to do the other things we might want them to do. They might actually buy a product. If we have a sponsor, they're more likely to actually go like you know buy from that sponsor now suddenly you can make so much more money than just the fraction of a cent of a single view that we then have to churn over and over again to get a brand new audience in so i start to move them towards these ideas of using the money is always the through line we need the returning yeah. viewers to get the money we need you know more retention like we need to get them further through the video so they see more mid rolls. Like the glorious thing about this, that uh, YouTube has created an ecosystem where doing the right thing for the audience also functionally does uh, help the bottom line. So I can get all yeah. the things I want in terms of being passionate about the audience and giving the audience a great experience. 
and while at the same time justifying that as a uh, as a way to build a better business yeah that that was so well said gwen and and i want to just add on to the whole you know what's the company's business objective right because we're they're all they all can be different so when i was at oracle you know we weren't looking at we didn't we weren't even monetizing we don't have we didn't have ads on videos you know one of our biggest kpis was how many people i sent to the oracle website you know how many people i sent to a registration page so they would have uh you know uh attend one of their tech events because that has more value than just views or subscribers or whatever so we start to look at kpis like well how many interactive cards did they click and how many were shown how many you know tracking urls in the description or comments love putting them in the comments by the way um how many people clicked on that link to go to the website or to sign up for whatever product page like that was more important at that company not views or or, or revenue because we weren't making any through that tool youtube was basically a marketing tool for um oracle when i was there I love that because you have two very different companies with two very different ways of yes. looking at things. And I think it's e it's easy to think that there's only one set of metrics that every business would be mm -hmm. most looking at when you really have to think, what is the purpose of this one? Maybe it's it's about education and getting people into you know products if it's some sort of SaaS product. Maybe it's about distribution and, and virality and some sort of other. And it's not because you're selling them some monthly subscription. So it can really vary based on where you're at. So you guys both have worked previously on YouTube channels. Maybe they have different strategies, but how does one really kind of get into those roles and how do you kind of really flourish in them when there is no one size fits all when it comes to channel strategy? Yeah. So I would say, you know, this is very interesting when you talk about specifically the type of work that Michael and I do, because there's kind of two halves of our personalities that we have to have, right? Mm -hmm. There is, yes, we need yeah. platform expertise. Like you need to know what you're doing. These, these platforms are complex. You need to be a, a specialist in these platforms. That's absolutely true. But there is, you know, to kind of go back to something that Michael alluded to earlier is there's a big people element here. And at a very large scale, these companies are very mm -hmm. large, a lot of stakeholders. And some people yeah. would say it's like, okay, so you have to be good at playing politics. I see that as like, it's just dealing with human beings, but on a larger scale, like everyone yeah. needs to feel like they're heard and that they're, they're like, their opinion is valid and, and their input is taken. Even if the decision doesn't break their way, you have to spend that time in that relationship building to kind of make that happen. And that is a very specific type of personality and skill set. And a lot of times someone who is really into the, you know, the YouTube space can sometimes like, they really just want to be like, as nimble and as quick as possible it's just them maybe a couple other people they get to make decisions quickly and they would just go insane if they had to then you know work with a large group to get buy-in and make everyone excited so we are half cheerleaders half like therapists yes. and <laughs> a half like, more than half there's so many halves that go into the complexity of educator educator yeah. yes that's a big one. Like I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a grade school teacher a lot of the time. Like <laughs> you're like and, hurting cats. <laughs> correct. And I'm a person who just like I enjoy each of those roles. Like I'm not sitting here being bitter that like uh, I wish it was just me and two other people and I could just say go do this. Like I do really enjoy that relationship building aspect and that ability to build consensus. So those are kind of the personality traits you need if you're going to go into like this part of the business. Yeah, there's a lot of layers of complexity with these corporations, you know, compared to, uh, you know, a single creator who, you know, lives by himself in a studio apartment and that's his company. So there's a, so many layers and, uh, you know, uh, and all this corporate kind of not BS, but like, you know, uh, presentations and reporting and stuff you don't think about, like, you know, Mark Rober doesn't have to think about, or, you know, some of these creators, they don't have to do that. They don't have to worry about workflows and naming a, a file name of an MP4 the correct way or won't get accepted. You know, like there's all of these different nuances and, um, you know, you also have to like pick and choose your battles. Um, you have to learn to push back 
on certain things and 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 present data to the to the person who's kind of pushing at you to do something to get something up on the platform that you're like well no you know here's the data this didn't work last time i don't think we should do it so um you know there's a lot of differences also just resources i mean you're navigating the sea of graphic designers and editors and video uh videographers and 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 also like pr so like a, a big thing is being brand safe right like these smaller creators don't have to deal with that you know as mm-hmm. as as a, a a brand you know or a corporation you have to watch their back and make sure everything that goes out is is protecting them and their ip i mean at wwe we constantly had to like just triple check everything we put up to make sure it was in line with the storyline of the wrestlers you know, or, you know, making sure they're safe or they're not showing a, a body part that might slip out or, you know, whatever. You, there's so <laughs> many different, I mean, it's, it's wild. All these things you don't have to think about when you're a smaller uh, right. creator. So, um, and then like, you wouldn't worry about wearing protection. a shirt that has a Nike logo or holding up a Kroger can of soda mm-hmm. or <laughs> like all of that. Know, stuff. Right? that. That could probably never happen. You know, that would, that would never happen. Now, one resource that I know that you wanted to bring up and talk about, and we're going to um, bring it up on screen here and show people, is if you are starting to get into this field as well, you can look. Mm-hmm. There is a new website out there that was started by Patty Galloway and, and some of his buddies, and it's called ytjobs.com. And this is a, a marketplace for people to come together and put job postings for YouTube strategists or video editors thumbnail designers, you can post jobs or you can post yourself as available for jobs here. And they try and give you some information about like how much it would be or if it's a per hour or per video type of thing. So if you are someone looking to get started, that is a place that you can go and you can filter by location or the type of job that you're looking for. Um, Like I said, so we've got uh, creative directors or thumbnail designers or channel managers, YouTube strategists, script writers. And I think it's so funny when you were like, the extra layers of people. And I feel like the more people you always bring into the equation, it's it's more about like facts than feelings, but people forget. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of feelings that happen. <laughs> so <laughs> you really do have to be, as Gwen alluded to, like half cheerleader, half like navigating personalities. Therapist. And that's, that's a tough one. Half therapist, half all the things, half all the things. <laughs> I, I will also say that, especially if you're young, like I cannot overestimate, like, you know, I think of my team of, you know, uh, channel uh, coordinators and channel managers, most of them found my, my job posting because they were connected to someone that I was connected to on LinkedIn. Okay. So I know it can be uh, LinkedIn is kind of the unsexy thing, you know, like, especially and if you were a little bit more say you're in, maybe you're already maybe you've already had some stuff, maybe you've done some independent creator stuff. And you're really like, I want that cushy corporate job, like use use who you know, to then connect yeah. with other people. And, uh, you know, and build out those connections, because someone's going to know someone who's going to know someone. And that's how you really it's still in this space, get in the door a lot of the time. Well, I know both of you. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and, and you know, what's weird is like, there's I don't know how you got into this one. But like, there, there's no YouTube university, right? Although I did hear and this is kind of a hush hush, but that Mr. Beast is working on a YouTube yes. course at Eastern Carolina University, yep. because he wants his pipeline of, of creators to come into his company, which is down the road. So, but there's no YouTube university. So it's like, well, how does somebody get into this? If there's uh, like no formal, um, you know, kind of degree or classes. So it's kind of like, I fell into it just getting, a, I went to film school, film school nerd. Yeah, and I, just yeah. got into, I was never really like, good, like really good at everything. So like, I got a little bit good at editing, a little bit good at cinematography. Then I took some graphic design courses and like, I'm, I was kind of confused in my career, right? And then it's just like, Oh my gosh, what is this YouTube thing? Wait a minute, it, it's a mishmash of all of my skills and it's like the wild, wild west. And there's no like, you know, uh, uh, layers like there is in, in TV and film, right? Like all these like blockers, like it's kind of the wild, wild west. So like in 2011, that's how I got into it. And it's been awesome ever since. But Gwen, how did you fall into it? I mean, it's the same story. Like we're also kind of the same generation where it's like mm-hmm. back in the day when my dad got into computer programming, there was no computer programmers back in like the 70s, mm-hmm. right? So like they hired everyone out of like the statistics department, right? Like there was just a thing like so for us, I think our gener- our, our, our for our generation, like the path in really was 
Like, so I have a TV film degree. I started out in Hollywood. I was bored to tears in television. Like it was the yeah. same, you know, cookie cutter and mm -hmm. no one let us experiment on anything. We had terrible data, almost no data. So like, I was like pretty early on, like, oh, like that, yeah. you know, this makes it so much better. So I very proactively, and, and at that point, and it was, you just kind of raised your hand and said, I want to do that. They're like, I don't know what to do with it. Sure, you start doing it, right? And I think that's starting to change now where, yeah, there'll be more yes. formal like pathways into this career, but we were just making it up. And that was the great thing is like, I'm like, cause like, I don't have like, I have a TV film degree. I don't have an, a, you know, a, a data science like degree. I was just like, oh, I like pairing that creative side that I have and yes. my knowledge of how creative minds work. And I also like the fact that we now have all this data that can make the creative better. And I was able to slip into that perfect niche of mm -hmm. like a lot of times the really hardcore data people have a really hard time communicating with the creatives and I can kind of bridge that gap. You know, even now when I'm hiring to like people that I can bring in, I look a lot at, I love like econ majors. I love like, you know, like, uh, psychology majors or social science majors, like anyone who really is really interested in how people tick, like how do people work? I find those are like um, some of the best people to hire into specifically the like, cause uh, I'm very much like my team isn't out there shooting in the field. So oftentimes I can struggle with TV film majors cause like they want to be on the ground. Right. But I'm yeah. looking for people who like, they're just going to be fascinated by like the whole, like, the whole YouTube is just like one big, like, you know, social experiment. And so like, if I can find people who get fascinated by the human behavior element, that's who I find is like the perfect inroad for my part of the business. Okay, Michael, we have a question from the audience. Are you ready? This one is coming oh, in specifically yes. hot for you. Here we go. Oh, so God. this is talking about WWE and Adam's X Place wants to know, are wrestling fans based on economic regional levels or something else because I stopped watching wrestling when I was in my late teens, mm -hmm. but another category that would be similar is NASCAR. Is it income or regionally driven because oh. they're so diverse against something, a property like that. So do you want to have any insight on your time yeah. at WWE and how you appeal to all these different demographics? Sure. So when I first started, I wasn't really into WWE. Like I didn't, I knew it from when I was a kid and I thought it was like the NASCAR crowd in Alabama. And it, it is not because they've done such a great job in their business at trying to grab every de demographic, changing the WWE divas to WWE women. Like, let's get women involved. Let's get children. Let's stop the nudity and everything, which I know the hardcore wrestling fans, like, they miss that. But as a business, they are crushing it because they've gone globally now. And, you know, when, when I was on the channel, we saw our biggest increase. I mean, I'm talking... So we were like 80% demographic being US based. And then out of nowhere, it was like 50% India and Pakistan. It's like wrestling like just hit India. We became obsessed with it. So like it is not what you think about being like a middle America kind of, you know, uh, you know, it is kind of a male soap opera, but like it's not just that demographic like it used to be. And I feel like it used to be the younger demographic, middle America. It is not. It is coast to coast, all over the world, people of every economic um, background, like in India, although like the, C the, the CPMs on our YouTube channel, Indian wrestlers or create a new wrestler mm. who's of Indian heritage, which they did with this guy, Jinder Mahal is his name. And I remember in 2016 or 17, like they, they, you know, they pushed him in the storyline and they gave him the, the heavyweight, heavyweight world championship title, whatever it's called now. And they gave that to him. And you know what? Boom, the traffic from India just increased. So they they adjusted and it comes from the top level in that in, in kind of a big brand like that. That's really smart, actually, to focus on a character from a region that is getting a lot of increased traffic and their buy in on that and having the data to go to the higher ups and be like, look at this. This means yeah. we need a new direction. Let's do this. Um, so that's pretty. Gwen, do you have any stories like that where you have like something that just came up in data that you found and that really kind of like changed direction for you on what you wanted to do with a channel or maybe release sooner rather than later? 
I think, you know, what I think is very, what I love about data again is like back in the television days, we just, we guessed, right? You had, you had one rating and then you kind of guessed at things. And I think we have Nielsen. such a lot of, yeah, exactly. I love you, Nelson, but no. <laughs> no, no. Um, 2000 TVs, don't tell the story. All right. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, there's a lot of assumptions we have made as essentially entertainment gatekeepers that now that we have the actual data of everyone voting with their feet, we know can be wrong. Uh, so for example, the last campaign was at Kin. Um, they were very much focused on women's lifestyle programming. We uh, launched a lot of channels with a lot of, uh, you know, celebrities of, you know, you know, a 35 plus. So like, you know, Hollywood is starting to kind of be you know, like ignore them because they're over the hill, quote unquote. And we're like, they have like a lot of the, like 20 years of like fan base who's not sitting here being like, oh no, they're over the hill. Like we still want to see them, but the gatekeepers can see that. So we're able to kind of give them, you know, uh, give them a, a, you know, a, a platform that they're no longer beholden to a gatekeeper to tell them, hey, like they can put out contact content every week and they're always relevant with their audience and what we found through doing that is a lot of the assumptions that you might have made about a certain audience base was not always correct so we had we uh did uh, a lot of different channels with women of color and some of them would be like you would just be like oh this is african-american women and african-american women between these two different channels they should have the identical audience no that's not true it is not a monolith right so we had a channel that was very much like Yes, it was black woman, but it was like it was like non-urban black woman. So it was like Midwestern or like in the South in areas. So they, you know, they were they they acted a lot different than those audiences that were say more coastal. And these were the assumptions that you would make about how what they would like, uh, you know, uh, be like connected to or not connected to, like we found out very quickly on that channel, we better not touch Halloween because there was such a, you know, uh, ingrained how they were raised where Halloween was a bad holiday that they had a ton of issues with it. Whereas an audience that if you looked straight at just the top level demographics, you would have been like, this is the same audience, may be like, oh, this is such a cute, you know, like that video was cute. So we learned very quickly that, oh, through the data we could figure out of like, this is a say a girl next door audience. We need to be careful about you know put you know, showing her like living it up too in too much luxury. Or on the other hand, we had another talent where like we we could show her like her elevator in her house, and her fan base was like, "You go get yours, girl." Like these are all the nuances that we never got when we just looked at like oh it's women 18 to 34 who happen to have this, you know, uh, demographic background. Like now we can go so much deeper and build these audience profiles of exactly like how Ooh. they, uh, who they are and how they are. Uh, oh no. Hey, I think someone just subscribed. I know who a this is too. <laughs> a joy I, just I know subscribed. who a joy is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it came off the screen. Apparently my overlay is the wrong size. <laughs> Thank I you so much for I just was on a phone call with him this week. Oh, wonderful. Last week. Well, there we go. We got we got him Making covered. <laughs> All right, we are starting to run low on time, which is always a bummer. So we you're going to have to say in the comments whether or not we need to do this again. But we're going to play a game called Hot Takes. So I'm going to make a statement, and then you can agree, disagree, or make an argument for what, whichever way you feel you should go with this. Are can you guys I ready? Can I use the Shelly answer of it depends? <laughs> oh, young squire, you are learning. Yes, absolutely. All right, we're going to start here. This time we'll go ladies first. So Gwen first, and then we'll go with Michael, and then we'll flip-flop on the next one. So the very first one is going to be going to be it's a scorcher right here the old youtube studio analytics was better than the new one agree or disagree oh, oh, and reasons um, why i would two years ago i would have agreed and now i disagree um and that is i, I being an old curmudgeon when it for the first shift first happened i was very against it and plus whenever you make a new switch like it's just buggy there was just things in there there was things in there that you know actually there is still a couple things that they still haven't reintroduced um that i yes, I, I do I i'm bitter about um but such from as? the actual interface such as so you used to be able to filter your, your retention graphs by subscription status and that was very key for me because 
you could see what how your subscribers reacted to a piece of content versus say people who were non-subscribed so it was helpful especially when you had a really viral video because when your video goes very viral and you're going further away from your core audience like your retention is just going to slip yeah uh because of just you know percentages and math, yeah. right so then if you could filter it by subscribers you could get it back down to be able to compare it better and like what does my core audience actually think? And if you've learned anything about me in this conversation, I truly believe in programming for your core audience. So that did really help. So there is some of those things that I'm, I, I miss, but yeah. I understand what YouTube is doing. And they are from a standpoint of like that interface in, in main studio, not advanced studio, like is so much more user friendly for the average user. And even for me, when I have producers or execs going in there, there's a lot of things that yeah. now just pop out that b belays them from coming to me with complaints like their whole <laughs> thing now of being able to like compare the first they said they tell you how it's performing like compared first 24 to like, hours like, first yeah. 24 hours i spent a lot of my time six or seven eight years ago tell reminding people that this video has been up for 24 hours this video that you're saying it's not performing as well as had been up for three years. And if you went back and looked at their first 24 hours of data, it was identical to this video. That was a Mic lot drop. of my time. <laughs> yeah. So this has made my life in many ways better, even if it has removed some of the features that I really, really liked. All right, Michael, you're up with that. And I, so I would say about six months ago, I was still bitter. I was still Ooh. bitter. I don't know. They changed the whole interface on YouTube, like in the back end. They changed it so much, which why didn't they just fix the plumbing in the back and keep the UI? Like we're all used to it. Why change it so much? Um, so I was bitter up until about six to eight months ago when I, I, I kept seeing updates and they're fixing some stuff. I kept getting like limited data limited data for for regions i'm like well why is that happening and i asked you youtube support and they're like oh well you're not getting enough traffic i'm like so you're not supporting the smaller guy but the guy that's getting billions of views okay so then it worked that feature works for him i don't know it was just very buggy <laughs> it's like it was like it was like when final when final cut when apple went from final cut to iMovie and now we've got the iMovie but they're adding they're putting these add-ons for iMovie and making it a little bit more robust and and awesome. and better I do have a special soft spot in my heart for iMovie cuz I also got my start on YouTube doing iMovie tutorials i even did an e-course about iMovie <laughs> to, to make it look like you're not editing inside of iMovie. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> next hot take. Are y'all ready? We're going to start with Michael this time. Yeah. Okay. So it says, a fantastic video with a meh thumbnail um, will do much better than a meh video with a superb thumbnail. Mm. Yeah. So, and I saw this on LinkedIn that somebody, I, it was some YouTube creator, but they said that 80% of your video's success comes from the thumbnail and i chimed in i'm a very opinionated person um no. but obviously <laughs> um so and i was like that is not true like because if you're if you have a, a stellar video i mean content is king if your video is entertaining youtube will push it out there and if your video is that good there's no way that you're going to have a bad thumbnail even if it just auto populates from some random frame in the video most likely it's going to be a, a decent click-through rate and if you can even get a decent click-through rate but you have a high retention rate uh you know watch time for that excellent video then the video will succeed and a good video will always succeed no matter how many little gimmicks you do gwen how about you I'm a little more uh, a 50-50 girl. Like, I, I do feel like, especially when you, uh, it, with court, with uh, media businesses that I tend to work with, because they're such content first companies and typically, you know, like distribution might be secondary on their brain. Like they put so much work into the piece of content and then slap whatever thumbnail on it. And, and I do think that is thought. damaging uh, because at the end of the day, you do have to get them to click, right? Uh, I do agree, like, you know, as long as you can keep that uh, click through rate decent, like, 
you know, at the end of the day, but it's really like if something has like a, you know, a less than a 1% click through rate, I'm like, it doesn't right. matter how great that video is. It, it's not going to do well. On the other hand, I also deal with the other direction where people will be like, oh, this video isn't performing. Let's just change the thumbnail and title over and over again. I'm like, that thing has a 15% retention rate. I don't care what brilliant thumbnail and title we put on that thing. Like <laughs> YouTube's never going to push it because obviously nobody likes the video. Like, so at the end of the day, well YouTube said. is smart. Well Sad. What You're if you have a less than 1% click through rate because of the fact you got on trending or popped off on like something like that? Because the farther and more broad it gets pushed, the lower your click through rate is always going to be. So you could very yeah, well be Yeah, it's never going to go that bad. I did. Yeah. I actually ran these these, these numbers okay. like last month because I was curious as well. So for the the uh, network of content, like the database of content I could uh, get a hand, my hands on, click through rate kind of logarithmically, I can't even say that word. It goes up as your views go up until you hit a certain point. And for right. us, that was like at the half a million mark. But Once I wonder if there was a click through rate mark, report for all of the top 20 videos on trending. Uh, but the video itself was fine, right? right? And vice versa. Like it, it's kind of becomes an explanation thing rather than I encourage people to optimize directly off of if this thing has a high AVP, I'm going to optimize for that regardless of what the views look like. Like that's going to get you into the point of like you're only going to ever do niche content for your 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 audience because that's what's going to give you the highest CTR and the highest AVP, but you're never going to grow. So for example, I spent like a hot second like playing around booktube and putting up booktube videos i have never seen as high of like avps and ctrs as the booktube community because they're small but they're passionate right they're but i was true. never going to grow very large because that's a very niche community so you do have to be careful with these things because they can like if you're just looking at them as isolated metrics they can take you down the road of like you're going to have five subscribers but they're going to love you <laughs> absolutely do you guys have time for one more hot take Sure. Okay. One more hot take. We'll start with Gwen. YouTube should have already bought TubeBuddy and VidIQ. Oh, I'm going to go with, they're never going to do that for the very simple reason they can just steal all their features as you can start <laughs> to see just creeping into the platforms. Why should they spend that money when they have engineers who can duplicate these features? Like there's, they're doing it to Tubular. They're doing it to TubeBuddy. They're doing it to vidIQ. It's just a free ground for them to be like, that's actually a really good idea. I bet we could actually do it better. <laughs> and, and then and see, it's really chipped away their business model. And see, I, I disagree. I think they should have. I mean, if they were going to do this, they would have done this years ago, right? Like, what, what's taking them so long? Like, hop on it. These are great tools. You know, why can I not do a bulk apply for interactive cards or end screen right? elements on thousands of videos, which TubeBuddy does brilliantly? Like, wh how, why is this not a thing on YouTube? You know, it, and it seems like it would also be a more cost effective to purchase one of these companies and just take those already built tools than to build from scratch from these engineers that make 300K a year and, you know, just like buy the small company and then and then okay. implement it into the, into the product. Well, and if you think about it too, a lot of it is all coming from a YouTube public API that these companies are applying and then using yep. these calls for. Yeah. So all of these features or something that they could easily steal, rip off, duplicate, because it's all using the same data that they're already providing. So I think my hot take is they don't want to because it's extra engineering on things that only a percentage of the audience would would actually use. Because it's not so much, you know, we want things to be engineered for the the creators and the uploaders and the companies and YouTube is always focused most so on like, let's push these features that are good for the customer. So we're yeah. not necessarily the customer in that way. And so if these companies are going to spend the manpower and engineering to do it, then I feel like they're just going to let those other good companies point. do it. <laughs> We're the, we're the three, we're the top 3% of users probably. Right? And that's, that's yeah. something I always remind myself every time I go to YouTube being like pretty pleased and they're like, nobody's yeah. going to use this, but you and like 200 other people. And I'm like, I know, but I, I want know, it. But we would love it. AB testing, AB testing from two buddies should have been like just one thing they bought or one thing they made. And they have but I think they would never want to do that because of the amount of like data, extra data that they would have to call and pull for that. Like oh. that's just 
for, I mean, it would there's be already more. limits. There's quotas. Yeah, yeah. There's quotas on how much you can pull from the API. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they are working on an A-B testing tool, which I think will be better than TubeBuddy's A-B testing tool. Because I possibly just... a simultaneous instead of a Correct. 24 hours. But again, I've been burned so much. I, I've been wanting this tool for so many I've years. been made promises. So, <laughs> so like, you know, they have to put in my hot little hands before I'm going to feel like before they're actually fulfilling believe it. their promises. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you guys, it's been amazing. We did run a little over time, so I want to make sure we respect that. Thank you for everyone who's been tuning in. I want to let people know where they can connect with you. So, Michael, where can people connect with you if they want more from you? Um, LinkedIn is the best. I don't have a personal um, YouTube channel. I do, but I never use it. I've always just been this corporate shill, you know, YouTube strategist. So, just empty inside. Um, but, but please subscribe. <laughs> So, yeah. subscribe to youtube.com slash sports illustrated or our si swimsuit channel um great channels we put out great content and also we have the street which is a wall street channel and then we also um just acquired parade magazine the celebrity magazine so that is coming under my wing right now and i have that youtube channel and it's awesome and there's good cooking content that's nice. It. How about Miss Gwen? Where can people can find you? You're on this side. I am also on LinkedIn. Um, so come find me there. I'm on Twitter, not as active there. I do actually have a YouTube channel now under Gwen Miller. Um, it has one video on it. I am working on my magnum opus video, which will be an intro how to track your your YouTube data. Like I'll provide you a free starter spreadsheet to get started. I promise you it can feel intimidating, but like I've got you down to like the absolute what you need to know. I know there's so many data points on YouTube. It can get confusing. I got you to like the what exactly you need to get started and then everything else is gravy and we can add on to it later. So stay tuned for that. Go ahead and go over there and subscribe if you're interested. And otherwise, yeah, hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. We'll chat. I'm really glad you're going to walk us through it because I opened the sheet and then I looked at it and then I closed the sheet. <laughs> just like, yeah, Shelly was my beta tester on seeing if the sheet worked. I'm like, Gwen will explain <laughs> it to me later, so I'm just going to put it away. But <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining me. If you guys out there think that we should do another session, make sure you comment that down below and we'll see you in a stream very soon. You guys stay on and we'll say goodbye off um, camera here. So to everyone else out there, we're going to wave and say thank you so much. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Have a great week.